Hello. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is big. This is big, guys. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk with our panel about what is probably has to be one of the most consequential developments in technology in the next decade plus, multiple decades here. Uh, you know, we're talking about the vehicles that get us everywhere. And there is a real mandate and pressure, obviously, with the concerns about climate change and the environment. So um, we're standing at this crossroads right now. As uh, the introduction said, we have a time when uh, we think we know a little bit with autonomous vehicles what the future is going to look like, but it certainly hasn't been implemented on our roads yet. And I guess I would like to just have you go down the line and talk just a little bit about this moment. Um, how soon are we going to see autonomy taking over the car business? And are we ready? And, and when can we be if we're not right now? Do you want me to start? Yeah. Um, afternoon, everybody. You know, probably the, one of the last cars that is ever going to be fully autonomous is an Aston Martin, you know, because we spend most of the time saving time with autonomy to go and enjoy the fun of driving an Aston Martin. So a absolutely, we are at a, at a fundamental crossroads of, of the future of autonomy, but everything is automated. The typewriter became automated, et cetera, et cetera. Automation is inevitable. Um, and it's such an important point. When does it happen fully? When do we have road systems and systems that support full autonomy, the, the level of autonomy that means you can have four people facing in? Is it 10, 15, 20 years? I, I guess legislation is going to tell us a lot of that. But the investment that is going into autonomy now is incredibly important. And as a designer, I think it's a very important future as well. I'm curious, your thoughts? I mean, you can, you can broaden the whole discussion even more, right? I mean, autonomous vehicles is basically moving engineering and uh, component-oriented uh, work that we have done as engineers into the world of software. So that, that's a complete new uh, dimension we're entering. And, and the world of software um, offers you even much more than autonomy, right? It's a whole new use experience. You can add services on the fly. You can upgrade a vehicle overnight. You can add functionality. So, so I think the, the big thing is that we are entering a world where software is not eating the world only, but also the cars, right? So, and, um, and artificial intelligence, to top the whole thing off, is adding so much more richness that uh, we are now just beginning to understand. And Carson? Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's an amazing environment, so much energy. I really love it. This is a big discussion, a big question you just asked, yeah? because it has a technology component. When will be technology be ready? Uh, it has a legislation component. Um, by the way, it will be driven by societies and not so much by, by, by our companies, because it will add value to societies, reduce traffic accidents, deaths people from traffic accidents. Um, if you ask, when are we going to see it? So if you mean level four all over the world under every condition, maybe never. If you ask um, level four in specific pilot areas, working it out, maybe around 2021. It will happen in China first, I'm completely convinced. But the most exciting and most important thing is it will change the business models of the whole transportation and automotive industry. And this is the most fascinating thing. This is the reason why we created Byton. Well, I want to talk a little bit about that, and we'll stick with you on this, because uh, you know, you're a, a new entrant in, into the field, so to speak. Um, you spoke to me backstage about you know, thinking of the car, especially with autonomous vehicles, things like that, as a platform, and really marrying all the software, all the possible data that can be collected. And, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about that and how that model n not just works in, in practic practical measures, but also what, what does that mean for what you're trying to build? So you could ask, does it really make sense to set up the next company for building and uh, selling electric cars? And the answer would clearly be no. There are so many out already. All the traditional companies eventually will build electric cars. It's not the point. 
but uh, technology like connectivity, like artificial intelligence, like uh, new styles of user interfaces will give the, the chance to make uh, the car smart. And by doing so, it will convert into a platform which we can use to sell digital content to our customers. And eventually, we will become a provider of mobility and not of selling cars. And this is an interesting thing because it's not only technology change, this is changing the business model. And changing a business model in an existing big company might be a big challenge, might be very difficult, if not impossible, uh, but it's a, a, a great opportunity for a new company. Mm -hmm. Well, so th that's a great transition into, you know, some some legacy players in this in this market, and 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 for Volkswagen, I, I'm curious about ownership models. And, you know, in the in the face of this purported threat from Uber and Lyft on car ownership, and um, there's a lot of understanding that you know car share and subscription services could be the solution. And and I'm curious if if Volkswagen has adjusted its thinking about what a car ownership model you know, in the 2020 decade and what that looks like? I mean, I mean, the world is not simple black and white, right? Um, sure. I mean, you will find a lot, lot of consumers in the world. We sell uh, nearly 11 million cars to 11 million different people. And uh, there will be a lot of people who want to own a car. And uh, I saw your presentation, Aston Martin. Uh, I understand why people want to own a car, right? 9-11, uh, you want to own probably. But um, a simple car to, to transport you from A to B, where transportation is your objective in the morning in rush hour where you cannot enjoy a sports car or another luxury car. You, you might have a, um, your, use your app Uber-like and utilize, utilize a vehicle and pay for the mile. I mean, and in between you'll find many, many different models. I mean, the disadvantage of a brick and mortar traditional company is also the advantage. There's a, a sheer financial power to sustain and try different models because no one really knows uh, what customers will do in five to ten years, right? So, so that's, I think, um, the disadvantage, also the advantage at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of gets to Aston Martin and the idea of, of a very high-end luxury brand. How do, how do you feel that that demand for having this crafted, you know, user-controlled vehicle, how, how do you marry that with this idea that people want to embrace this technology and they want, um, they want to see an autonomous driving future? You know, I, 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 it's why we created or reinvented Lagonda. So we are Aston Martin and Lagonda, and Aston Martin will maintain its emphasis on driving cars, cars to be driven. But again, don't forget most luxury products, in particular sports cars and race cars, cars that go on circuits, have so much data. They have so many control systems in them, much more so than a lot of the cars that are on the road now, that we have collected data about driving experiences, driving feeling, monitoring the driver in a 24-hour race. Using that technology eventually to make driving better when you do drive, your experience, Lagonda is the potential answer to autonomy. It's a full BEV product. So that's the answer to an autonomous luxury future, because mm -hmm. there has to be one, clearly. And that's why we've put the two brands there, and Aston Martin remains as the car you drive, the Lagonda is the car you would be driven by. Mm -hmm. we, we talked a little bit uh, about this idea of, as, as a designer, marrying technology with you know, some of the just the raw physical things that make driving a car so exciting. How do you, how do you, how do you balance that yeah. in, 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 in a vehicle that you're you know, supposed to get behind uh, and feel the motor? <laughs> but it's, every time we, we force society into a, into a box, into a system, there's always an alternative. As soon as we have more and more MP3 players playing music, the advent of vinyl starts to rise because someone wants something different. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants the feeling of placing the stylus on the record and hearing the analog music. So analog is always important in a digital world. Mm -hmm. And within the luxury space, people want to know that their shoes have been handmade, but they also want to understand the technology, the autonomous systems, the voice recognition systems, the gesture control systems as well. They, they want to marry both together, which is why 
for a designer, it's an incredibly exciting point in time because there are more and more things being made by hand. Mm -hmm. And there are more and more things becoming digital. And if I just, again, draw a parallel of the watch, a tourbillon, an incredible tourbillon built in Switzerland tells the time to within maybe half a second on a daily basis versus a digital watch, which is accurate to within 10 decimal places. Right. But the, the relevance is still there. People still want handmade watches, mm -hmm. but they also want technology as well. Mm -hmm. I want to shift a little, and I want to talk about when you're designing for this future. How do you take into account some of the more, I guess, ethical ramifications of this? You know, you, I, I saw a, um, an MIT study recently that mentioned uh, you know, how, serving people how they would want uh, a car to treat different people when it comes to making a decision of whether or not they have to hit them or something else. And, and there, there's a lot of ethical considerations uh, baked into that, as well as data collection. You know, you're building something from the ground up, something that's going to be a platform that people are going to you know, input all their data in. How, how do you think about designing and, and building for a future where you know, we're not only safe inside our vehicles, but we're safe with the information that we're you know, entrusting them with. Yeah, first of all, we have to consider and to understand this technology will add value to societies. It will save lives. We will not be able to avoid accidents completely, but we will be able to reduce them by 80% or something. There still will be accidents, but much less. It's, it's right, there are some ethical considerations to discuss. There are a lot of potential uh, answers to it. This will have to go through a process in the society to discuss and eventually to, uh, to agree on something. And this will take some time. But the, 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 basic, the baseline is it will add value and we will save lives. This is very important. Uh, when it comes to data collection, um, obviously, as a company, you have to follow all the, the, the rules and the legislation in all the countries. Um, and this is a point which is discussed, obviously, a lot. At the end of the day, it depends on what kind of value can you create out of this data, what kind of value can you give back to your customers. And this is uh, the, the, the measure they are going to decide if they like it or not. Everybody can decide not to do it, as you can to do with your smartphone. Uh, most of the people are not switching it off because they would like to make use of functionalities which add, add, add value. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the last point, um, this is maybe something we are discussing very much in our generation. Uh, if I listen to younger people, they are much more open in sharing their personal data because they are, they are, they are born into a world where, there is more, where this is no more, more normal. I, I would pose that to you as, as well and, and simply add on with that, yes, there are new generations. I'm, I'm part of that generation, <laughs> um, but I'm also incredibly wary of, of the way that you know, my, my data has been used. And, and I think as our technology layer moves into the real world, all those considerations are, are more and more grave. And I, I, I'd just like to pose sort of the same question to you and how, how you guys are thinking about it. Um, GDPR uh, is teaching us right now how to handle privacy, right? And, and um, in the beginning, when GD, uh, GDPR was introduced by the European Union, there was a lot of nervousness in the industry about how to handle it, right? Because it's a very complex process. On the other hand, I, tr I truly believe it's a competitive advantage, and it will be um, a different issue in five to ten years. If I see my, my kids already becoming more and more wary of their data, what they share on social media, Two or three years ago, my daughter shared everything. No, she's become a little bit smarter. But the point is, I think that um, the, the, the more we feel observed in our world, like in China, we have cameras everywhere taking a picture of your face and uh, analyzing your movement uh, on, a, on a meter by meter basis. This is only going to work a certain time until people reflect and, um, and, and, and want their privacy controlled. And they, as you said, they want to decide if they're going to sell the data or not. Today, they don't sell the data. Today, you give data away and you get something in return, which you think right now is a value. Maybe in two years, it's not a value anymore. Mm -hmm. But let's, we call it consent management. That will be, I believe, the key uh, in the future society to control your own privacy destiny much more than today. It's more than just opting in. It's making a decision to opt in and opt out anytime you want, with any data point you want. 
And um, this is, by the way, a very tricky, um, from a technologist, technologist a very tricky um, approach. I mean, we are developing software that allows customers to, on a data field level, to opt in or opt out what they want to share. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is, I think, um, depending on how society develops, but that's my feeling, which is going to happen mm -hmm. in the next 10, 10 years. Looking towards the drivers, the users, getting the signals and adapting to them, perhaps a little better than some of yeah. the technology yeah. companies have done recently. Um, we just have a, a, two more minutes here, and I, I, I would like to end by asking each of you, and we'll just go down the line, let's set some expectations in terms of, you guys are in the thick of, of this, we're always in this race to have technology meet us right now, and I think we've seen recently that that race can be detrimental. Um, setting expectations, how, how do you guys down the line, what would you like to impart to our audience here uh, so, you know, what, what we have to look forward to in the next, let's say, five years? Uh, in the next five years, I think, it, it, you know, we started the conversation with saying we're, we're at a, a fundamental shift in both in the automotive world, but in our world, in our connected world as well. And I think the conversation so far has shown a lot of that. And it's an incredible time for a designer. Just listening to the last two questions, actually, because whenever there is a, a counter there, a designer's mind is always thinking about, well, what's the potential there for? And what's the potential for cybersecurity, for making sure we are secure? And if we have knowledge and we have information and we have imagination, we can create and make a better world. Mm -hmm. And I think in the next five years, there will be an improvement. You know, the safety systems that are being developed on the roads will make society better in the end. And I think in the next five years, you'll start to see more of that, more relevance, monitoring systems so that you can know when to drive, when is it safe to drive, when should I be driving. And within the world of luxury, we have that opportunity because we're selling fewer cars at a higher price point, so you can involve more of that um, technology and future thinking technology within the product. Okay, rapid fire, we have 45 seconds. <laughs> can, you, can you both get it in? Okay, a cars will become smart device on wheels, so very pretty, beautiful car from outside. If you step in, it feels like a smart device, big screens, high-speed connectivity, all the ecosystem in it. We will see shared mobility based on autonomous driving and new business models. This is where Byton is designed for, and if you are interested in our crazy journey, feel free to f follow us on our social medias. I think um, the, excite the exciting thing about the future is choice. We'll have so many different um, business models that you can choose from as a consumer, so many technology approaches, full autonomy on certain roads maybe, up to manual driving on a racetrack, and I think it's going to be 10 times more choice than we have today. All right. Thank you all so much for listening and having us. Thank you to our panelists. Thank to you. the future. Thank you.